Welcome back to Block TV. It's time now for Long Read Sunday, where we take the time to take a look at the mass news and information market that is crypto Twitter. Now, it is a huge task keeping track of it all, but fortunately for us, we have a man who is able to do it all for us to sift through the good from the bad, the wheat from the chaff, and determine what is worth looking at. I'm talking, of course, about Nathaniel Whittemore with his Long Read Sunday crypto column, where every week he breaks it all down for us. And we have him here joining us today. Nathaniel, firstly, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. All right, so we'll get to your list and Long Read Sunday in just a moment. But before we do, as we record this session right now, markets in the US have opened. And after a weekend where fears of the coronavirus in China spreading have caused a great halt on markets uh, the world over, we're seeing the same thing play out in the US now with the Dow Jones down around 500 points at the time of filming. Uh, Nathaniel, firstly, just initial thoughts on this and what it could mean uh, looking into the future? Well, so I, I think that there's two questions. And the first one that everyone is going to ask and is asking is, are these phenomena related in the sense that is Bitcoin's movement up over the last 24 hours uh, related inversely with what's going on and, and kind of fears in the market, right? Is Bitcoin behaving as a non-correlated asset or is it, you know, oppositely correlated in some ways? Um, and everyone's asking that because this happens anytime that you see market volatility. So the volatility index is also at its highest level of this year. Uh, people ask if Bitcoin goes up, whether that is signifying something about Bitcoin, right? So it brings up the questions about safe haven and all these sort of things. Um, and I think that there's, like, like I said, I think that there's two questions. One is whether people believe that there is some correlation between uh, the, the, the fears happening in the broader markets and the rise of Bitcoin. Um, and then second though, which is interesting is how many times it's almost like how how long it takes for this to become self-fulfilling prophecy whether it's intrinsically true or not and what i mean by this is that every single time we see something like this happen where regular markets are down on some fear or some uh volatility indicator and bitcoin goes up it reinforces or adds merit to the idea that that's what bitcoin does in these situations which means that people then start to trade against that presumption the next time it happens so there's this really interesting thing that we're all living through when it comes to these questions of safe haven asset or just non-correlated asset, which is that uh, you, you have this middle factor, which is people speculating about what others think. And those speculators are actually driving in some ways it to become self-fulfilling prophecies. So that's what interests me right now is uh, every time this happens, I try to gauge the perspectives of uh, what people think uh, is the case and see how far it shifts to, uh, to this becoming just an inevitability. All right, certainly, as you say, that self-fulfilling prophecy may be the case, but uh, if you can create your own narratives and they become the widely accepted truth, well, that may be where Bitcoin is headed in the future. Anyway, this will be one we'll be watching closely. And now, just before we get to your uh, top five, let's start with a quick honorable mention uh, that I know you want to cover on the Schnorr Taproot uh, Bitcoin uh, soft fork updates uh, proposed. Recently hit a new milestone. Looks like they're well on track. What can you tell us? Yeah, so this is an update that uh, I think most people are thinking about in the context of improved privacy uh, in the Bitcoin context. And um, the, effectively, this uh, we've moved from this being kind of a discussion and something reviewed to an actual proposal now, which is just uh, effectively the next step on its journey to becoming a, an actual part of Bitcoin core code, right? So the types of comments that you're seeing now are people saying, hey, you know, I've started to uh, read about this a little bit, but what are the actual counter arguments? Or is this just something that everyone thinks uh, is right and agrees on? And um, the reason that I wanted to give it this honorable mention is that it's still very much in a in the you know messy kind of consensus process, social consensus process of, of Bitcoin. But I think it's something that we're going to be talking about a lot more. Um, and in particular, as it as it adds uh, or it potentially adds additional privacy to Bitcoin, I think it's going to be something that's worth watching. Uh, you know, if and as it gets implemented, particularly in the context of um, you know a regulatory uh, regulatory scrutiny around privacy preserving coins. Mm, certainly it'll be an important and close one to watch. All right, but let's uh, dive in uh, full throttle to the list, starting with your number five for this week. 
This is coming in an article on Medium from Daniel Goldman, uh, directed at Bitcoiners with the statement, how not to critique Ethereum. Uh, an interesting point about two communities uh, engaging with each other. Uh, break it down for us, Nathaniel. What's the uh, crux of the argument here? Yeah, I mean, so listen, my one of the drums that I beat constantly is that smart disagreement and debate is incredibly important. It drives the space forward, but we waste an incredible amount of time just in these, uh, you know, basically holy wars, right? And I think that what's happening now is that uh, some of these, these crypto asset communities are finally starting to move far enough apart that they actually operate at least to some extent in their own ecosystems entirely and uh, and perhaps they're not running up against each other right um, however there is still an incredible amount of time wasted i think in some ways uh between different communities uh, effectively saying that they're not just debating particulars of their proposed solutions or how they're addressing problems or whatever but like the fundamental things that they're attempting and what i liked about this piece is that it is a it's effectively a summation of something like five or six arguments that come up frequently with regard to Ethereum. Uh, and the, the author, Daniel Goldman, is saying that, look, you know, here's why you shouldn't use these arguments, and it's his counterpoints. Now, of course, this is not ending debate. Uh, this is going to, in fact, I'm sure, uh, increase debate and is going to have a ton of people then reading and saying this. But I think that anything that actually elevates the level of debate in this space uh, is, is much more valuable than just kind of this a priori or personal invective. Uh, and so I wanted to use like whatever little platform I have to call out when I see something that I think uh, increases the level of debate rather than kind of diminishes it and, and sends us on our, uh, towards our, towards our worst base instincts instead. Yeah, certainly uh, a bit more of a positive spin on what can sometimes become uh, a bit of a toxic debate uh, between those particular communities right there vying it out at the uh, top of the cryptocurrency markets. But if we turn to your number four for this week, you have more to say uh, on the matter of Ethereum. Uh, an interesting piece that, uh, again put out on Medium by Josh Stark and Evan Van Ness talking about the year in Ethereum 2019. Nathaniel, tell us what drew your attention to this piece. Yeah, I mean, this is another one. It's kind of, I think, uh, we did a lot of end of year content, obviously, a few weeks ago. But I thought this was one was still worth mentioning because it's such a comprehensive look at uh, the different, um, you know, basically the different pieces of what happened in 2019 around Ethereum. So uh, they talked about first the Ethereum economy, how it continued to grow. Second, they talked about the idea of Ethereum nudging into the mainstream uh, with corporations and consumer brands actually beginning to use it. Three, they talked about improvements on Ethereum 1.0, as well as uh, fourth, uh, the progress being made on Ethereum 2. And then fifth, they talked about layer two uh, improvements. Um, I think that there's, like I said, uh, the, the reason that I wanted to call it out is it's such a good primer on uh, an insider's take effectively in the Ethereum community uh, and what's been going on. I think that the, the, the part that I agreed most vociferously with is the um, importance and continued growth and importance around DeFi. I think it's unarguable that uh, the two things that people talk about in crypto in some ways right now, or the two biggest things are uh, Bitcoin and its role in the global macro environment and as a digital gold and as a hedge and all the things that that might mean. Uh, and second is what DeFi is doing and what programmable money might look like. Um, now, there are tons of other things that people are working on, but I think those two things stand heads and tails above the rest right now, at least in terms of narrative uh, and, and just uh, pure, pure attention. Um, I'm not sure that I totally agree with the idea that Ethereum has nudged into the mainstream. I don't particularly think that anything has nudged into the main mainstream. And I think that uh, to the extent that you're actually looking at last year's uh, mainstreaming it's basically uh, Bitcoin and the idea of digital currencies more broadly, right? The words Ethereum, for example, were the word Ethereum wasn't spoken at any of the hearings in the US around Libra. Um, now, Bitcoin wasn't uh, the main topic of conversation either. However, it's very clear that in the mainstream sector, there's Bitcoin and other things. Um, I don't actually think that that's necessarily a problem. My instinct is that 
if Ethereum breaks into the mainstream, it's going to be because there is something that people want to do that has Ethereum powering it in the background uh, that no one even knows or has to know. So uh, anyways, but I, I think that regardless of that and these you know squabbles about the points, um, it's, a, it's a really great piece uh, to start just getting a sense of everything that's been happening uh, for, for anyone who's interested. Mm, certainly, as you say, it uh, sort of trying to lay a bit of the ground for the infrastructure out there. Uh, maybe we don't need the, the fame of Ethereum out in the world, but the plumbing underlying a future DeFi global economy. We'll have to see how that one does pan out. But speaking of uh, Bitcoin and others, let's say, uh, let's move now to your number three for this week and talk about BCH for a moment, because that's not something we often bring up in Long Read Sunday, but... Uh, has had some interesting developments this week. Uh, take, give us a breakdown. Yeah, I, I jokingly said, what does it take to actually get BCH in LRS? Uh, if you see BSV in here, it'll be a real, a, a, a real shocker. But, um, you know, I think, I think that the, there's such a clear, um, there's clearly an important conversation that is bigger than just uh, Bitcoin Cash. So basically the four largest miners uh, in the, four largest mining pools in Bitcoin Cash have come together to say that for the next six months, uh, we need to divert 12.5% of all block rewards into um, a fund, which is a new fund set up in Hong Kong uh, that will be used to fund development pr uh, protocol development efforts. And so effectively they're implementing something like a founder's reward in the context of Zcash or you know whatever. Uh, it, depending on your perspective, this is either called a dev tax or a founder's reward or a development fund, right? So there's a lot of different words that mean the same thing that are all kind of biased based on your political perspective on it. Um, but the interesting thing is that in addition to uh, just whether that's a, a good idea or not and whether people will or won't support that, um, um, the miners are being very aggressive about it, right? This wasn't something that they put to the community and said, hey, we should talk about this. They came together, made this decision and uh, and said, we're doing it. And if you don't abide by this, we'll orphan your blocks. So it's a very aggressive move. Now, uh, there's at least some acknowledgement of that in the fact that it's temporary, right? It's uh, something like only six months. Um, however, it's uh, it's basically, uh, as, as I think one commentator said, it's a, an open cartel formation. Um, um, and so, you know, the interesting thing is that the debate has had a bunch of different contexts, right? I, I think there are really two, two things. One is most people or so, some people are, or people are divided about whether it's a good idea for BCH in general to have this sort of uh, dev pool, right? Um, so uh, Amin Gunser uh, wrote why, for example, it might be actually valuable for that. Um, where people don't disagree is the idea of uh, having for you know, large miners come together to make this decision unilaterally is basically the height of, uh, of, of antithesis to theoretically what this space stands for, including BCH. Uh, and, um, and so that's been kind of universally poo-pooed. Uh, I think that part of the reason that I also wanted to share Vitalik's post on this is that it does get into this larger question of just uh, funding for for uh, open source development and how it's going to work and how it's going to work inside these uh, these crypto asset communities. So uh, it's a really interesting case study, even if you don't particularly care about BCH as an asset uh, and aren't involved in the community. Do you see any uh, correlation between those announcements and the uh, double digits pump that we've seen in BCH today? It seems to be leading the market uh, in regards to uh, top 10 crypto growth? I don't know. It's hard to say. I, like, it was hard to get a read on exactly what the BCH community thought about this, because on the one hand, there were some folks who were, uh, you know, as you might expect, not happy about it. But then there's also a huge amount of, uh, of kind of just goes with what uh, the leaders of the movement are saying, right? There's, a, there's more of a, you know, the interesting thing is that I think that in some to some extent, there's cults of personality in all of these assets. Um, the cult of personality around an anonymous figure who can't come in and make designations uh, tends to be less um, deterministic in terms of behavior than cults of personality around existing figures. So, you know, I don't know to what extent we're seeing that, but uh, my my sense is that usually when pumps happen, uh, it, 
you never see anything pump really without Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin pumps, everything else pumps because people then go start to play the casino game of, uh, of altcoins. So I don't know if this is that, uh, but I, I certainly don't know if it's, I, I don't know why it would be correlated with this unless people are really excited that they think that this will matter. But, you know, this is a desperation move. BCH has lost more core protocol developers than basically any of the other top assets over the last year or so. So uh, it, it's not a positive thing, even if it's a good uh, attempt at restoring something. All right, uh, certainly one to watch out there. But let's uh, flick over to your number two for this week. Uh, and this time, another focus on Davos. Uh, what came out of it? Uh, we're now uh, past the entire event. And what would you say were the uh, key focuses as far as you were concerned? Yeah, so uh, we talked about this last week, kind of teed up the whole week around Davos. Um, I think it was largely as expected, but still useful to to see that in practice. So uh, like, takeaway one was um, we're still very much in the blockchain or, you know, and or now government digital currencies, not crypto world, right? Not Bitcoin. Uh, Lee uh, Quinn from Coindesk reported that basically uh, no one was interested in talking about Bitcoin. Everyone was panning it. It just wasn't a, a thing on the agenda, um, which in some ways makes sense. I mean, Bitcoin is singularly uh, opposite from like from an organizational structure, from a genesis point. From, like it could not be more the antithesis of working groups of existing world leaders at Davos uh, mindset, right? So it's not surprising that that's in some ways the, the part of the crypto community that is the farthest away away from whatever happens in Davos. Um, so that was part one. I think takeaway two, though, is the the emergence of Libra and the Chinese digital yuan have absolutely uh, impacted and, and aggressively shifted the take uh, or the, the diligence with which um, governments are looking at digital currencies around the world. Uh, we saw the World Economic Forum itself put out a, a toolkit for CBDCs. We saw governments from Hong Kong and Thailand and Japan announce plans around CBDCs. Japan was intentional about saying that it was concerned about the potential for growth in China's economic influence in emerging markets, and that was why they were doing it or they were exploring it. Uh, you had Christopher Giancarlo, Crypto Dad, the ex-CFTC chair who was pushing his Digital Dollar Foundation. He appeared at something like five events uh, all throughout. And uh, Giancarlo's uh, really was interesting, his argument. He basically was making an argument that we have three choices for kind of a, a large scale digital currency. Uh, and he was ignoring Bitcoin, by the way, it's completely ignoring Bitcoin. But the three choices were one, uh, you had a, a corporate controlled coin where uh, they want all the information to surveil all the information about every transaction so they can use it for their own financial means. Uh, second, you have a Chinese digital currency where they want to surveil all the information to use it for political means. Or third, you have a US digital dollar where the ability of the government to surveil it is limited by the constitution. So this is his argument. He actually is arguing that the least surveillable currency is a US based digital dollar because of constraints imposed by uh, by the U.S. political system. Now, this is obviously, uh, there are plenty of people who wouldn't even consider themselves cynical who are going to scoff at that uh, and, and say that it doesn't matter whether that's blocked constitutionally when you have uh, three-letter agencies in, in the U.S. who are going to do pretty much whatever they want to do with it if it's available. However, it is interesting that that's the argument he's making. So all in all, Davos was, as we anticipated, uh, largely about digital currencies and the battle for digital currencies, not so much uh, any of these existing crypto assets in our space. Yeah, certainly a, an interesting argument to be making uh, at this stage. I don't know if a, a lot of the world consensus is there to say that the U.S. would be the uh, the marshal and champion of a uh, global currency uh, in a digital surveilled world, but he's making the argument nonetheless and getting the U.S. back on the playing uh, playing field as it comes to CBDCs. Again, certainly uh, one to see how that pans out with regulators. But let's now turn to something that is happening uh, with regulators in the U.S. at the moment. Turning to your number one for this week, uh, as you put it, a major blow to privacy. Uh, you know, Apple uh, not going to go to that end-to-end uh, -end encryption. Uh, what do you make of this, Nathaniel? So Apple has been the champion of personal privacy uh, relative to big tech companies, right? Um, this is a legacy that goes back to Steve Jobs. Uh, again. 
the cynical take is that their business model doesn't require them to impose upon privacy because they're a company that sells physical things and that's where they make their money. Whereas all these companies that traffic in data don't really have that privilege. However, it also has been, you know, again, to what extent it was cynical at the beginning, it's something that, you know, when people choose if they're going to work at Apple or Google or Facebook, that's something that they consider given that it's been a legacy. More than that, Apple has, uh, it has kind of lived up to that, right? Like if you, um, there was an interview actually uh, a while ago with uh, Richard from Monero, Fluffy Pony, where he talked about, uh, where he talked about basically the, uh, the extent to which, or the, the surprise that he had that of all the big tech companies, Apple really was the one that seemed to care about privacy. Um, they've been in a battle with the attorney general in the US around end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, basically the attorney general and the US government want there to be uh, back, back doors to end-to-end -end encryption for US devices to help uh, law enforcement. And Apple has been fighting that tooth and nail or so it seems. But uh, we've, uh, Reuters broke the story that um, Apple had basically Basically succumbed to pressure from the FBI. They were planning to implement end-to-end -end encryption uh, on iCloud for um, for users' data that was backed up on iCloud, and they did not. They decided not to implement that. So it wasn't something that they changed a feature of after it had already gone live. It was just something that they decided never to implement uh, because of pressure from the FBI. It's obviously a big deal because part of the promise or what makes uh, something like the iPhone valuable for people who care about privacy is that those for the for the data that's stored on the phone it's stored locally. Um, the problem is that most people just automatically and the phone pushes you to automatically shift to iCloud for everything storage. And then what we're finding out is that that's not going to be end to end encrypted in the same way. So uh, it's a real blow to privacy advocates, um, you know, both for what it is and also for who is succumbing to that pressure. Certainly uh, a difficult one and one, a battle that's likely to play out over the, the remaining year in uh, US politics uh, as we get closer and closer to that election, the issue of privacy and uh, retail access. And it's, a, it's certainly one right on the salient list for people to assess, but uh, we'll have to see how that one plays out. Nathaniel Woodmore, I want to thank you so much for taking us through your top five for this Long Read Sunday. So much going on out there, plenty more ahead. So for those at home, make sure you keep watching at blogtv.com for all the latest in news and information. I'm Asher Westrop Evans. Thanks for watching. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.